Good evening from Japan. This is World News, where we see dawn break over the vast devastation. New images of the fury of the tsunami as we fly into the region obliterated by its power. Millions of people lining up for food, water, shelter. And now tonight, urgent escalating questions about the problems at the nuclear power site. A second explosion at a third reactor, volcanically hot fuel rods exposed. Families line up for radiation tests, asking what are the chances of a catastrophic nuclear meltdown? And amid the worry, help starts to arrive, as everyone hopes for still one more incredible rescue. From ABC News, this is a special edition of World News with Diane Sawyer, Disaster in the Pacific. Reporting tonight from Japan. Good evening tonight from the coast of Japan, where all of us at ABC News are bringing you a story we have never seen before. We know the crushing impact of that earthquake and the tsunami that swept away thousands and thousands of lives. But word tonight of an issue at a nuclear site, which at the very least could be uncharted territory. There are three reactors at one location in trouble. We know that two had explosions releasing some radiation. And now word that at a third reactor, uranium rods with core heat of 3,400 degrees have been partially or perhaps entirely exposed, raising the question of a nuclear power meltdown. The Japanese have now called in American nuclear experts and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Even as those new images remind us of the violent events on Friday, in the north, an entire town whose houses rode the rapids today flattened by the water. A minivan, no match for the jet speed waves. And this is what the passengers saw as the brown waters overwhelmed the airport as they waited to board their planes. Our team is out across the disaster zone tonight, and we start with the dramatic events of this day as we traveled into the northern part of Japan. Here it is. The the savage effects of this water coming across the seawalls couldn't stop it, the floodgates couldn't stop it. We're seeing those iconic scenes like the airport. That's where we saw those women with their pink parasols on the roof and the sign that said help in English. And we're looking at these places where these giant, giant tunnels of black water swept in and picked up all of those cars. And today, a new way of seeing the raw power of the tsunami as it hit. New images of neighborhoods on the move. The water swirling, smashing a community of homes. Drivers taking refuge on top of their cars. And a new sense how quickly the tsunami struck. There was calm water, then warning sirens. Then moments later, watch the water bubble. The surge catching the speeding minivan, dragging it away. And the clear, stark reality of what once was, erased by water. The Sendai airport then and today. The Daiichi nuclear plant before and after. On the ground, on street after street, a kind of twisted sculpture garden. Come with me now for one walk down one street and you'll see what we mean. The bookstore. Not one car, not one truck, but three all plowed in on top of each other. And you can see it's layered, it's stacked one upon the other. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can't even count. And this was the only way to get gasoline? Throughout the city, people patiently waiting hours for gasoline. The line stretching into infinity. A waiting an hour and you wait as long as it takes? Yes. This is unbelievable. 500 cars and that'll be it. For a city the size, this is a city of a million people. On other streets, other lines for food. How long have you been in line? Two, three hours. Do you have any water at home at all? Absolutely not. None? Nothing? Nothing. Hi, what do you want to buy? This young man told me he has come to buy any food that doesn't require water to cook it. And milky mushrooms. And you have oh, chestnuts. 
This woman says she has enough water at home, but not enough to eat. At another point, we stop at a shelter. Remember, two million people are in a country, cold at night, without power. Families making the most of what little they have. And how long have you been here? I can't count anymore. Maybe, maybe five days. We slept, we slept like three nights in the car. In the car? <laughs> Outside, the search. Have you seen, do you know, a husband on a bicycle looking for his missing wife, showing her picture. And near us, a rescue mission that got there too late. We watched as they recovered the body behind the blue tarp. But hope is revived by the near miraculous rescues like this man pulled out of the rubble. And another, 60 years old, clinging to his rooftop as he floated 10 miles offshore. And these people stranded on the roof of a school, looking down, seeing something moving. A car piled in mud and debris. People still alive. They alert the rescuers who find three elderly people in the car who had been stuck there. For 20 hours, no food, no water. They pulled them out, warmed them up. She says she was washed away by the waves and so afraid. Survival and a kind of strength, a stoicism. We're working days on it. And this this is husband and wife job. told me oh, they were determined to dig their business out one shovel at a time. Well, good luck to you. So look at this. Down the street, a home ravaged by the tsunami. But we discover inside... The clock is still running. The clock is still ticking. As if to say, time goes on. And that other big worry, of course, the nuclear plant. As we took the helicopter, we had to circle away, detour away from that nuclear site. And down below, so many people, it's in effect a city the size of Toledo, have been told to stay inside or evacuate. And our David Muir is there as the experts try to figure out what's going on. David? Diane, in a sign of just how dire this situation has become, the Japanese government has now reached out to the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and to the U.S. The Japanese government determined here in a desperate race to avoid a catastrophic meltdown. Entire families who escaped the shadow of the doomed nuclear power reactors are now coming here, worried they were exposed to radiation. We were given extraordinary access to the test site where medical teams wearing hazmat suits use megaphones to direct the parents and their children where to go. They're using Geiger counters and handheld scanners, checking everyone one by one, especially the most vulnerable, the children, scanning this little girl's hair. And there are countless young faces here. There are three nuclear reactors in trouble tonight at what's called the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Just two days ago, an explosion at Reactor 1 released radioactive material into the air. Then just yesterday, a second blast at Reactor 3 releasing more. And while dramatic, these are not the worst case scenario. Tonight, there is growing concern over Reactor number 2 becoming dangerously overheated. Inside each of those blown out buildings sits a fiery hot nuclear core inside a small structure. Cool water must be pumped in to avoid a disastrous meltdown. But the pumps failed in the earthquake and the tsunami, and so they've been flooding them with ocean water. That, too, not working. Twice today, the red-hot cores were exposed, and now real fear of a complete meltdown. Already here, trace amounts seeping out from those first two explosions. The crew aboard three U.S. helicopters flying 60 miles from the plant experienced a small exposure, cleared up by washing down. Here on the ground, authorities told us that more than 100 people in just one day testing positive. They've been taken to area hospitals for further testing. And today, this image of a girl who's been isolated for decontamination, peering through a window at her dog. And the evacuees keep coming. This woman brought her parents and, your and her grandmother. And they tested your grandmother yeah, too? Yeah, Some... And your grandmother was okay? Okay. She's okay? Yeah, okay. Everyone? Everyone. Okay. They tell us relieved. everyone is okay. But as we traveled the perimeter of this evacuation zone, the question now emerging, is the government here being completely forthcoming? <laughs> this couple tells us they understand the government doesn't want to scare the people, but they also suspect that they are not getting the full picture. 
that couple told me they did not want to leave their home but had to for food and water. We've also learned tonight that the Japanese government has distributed more than 200,000 iodine pills to stave off the effects of radiation. They say it's just a precaution, but Diane, another signal that this is a very serious situation on their hands tonight. Back to you in the north. That's right, a very tiny little pill, but it can make a very big difference. But we wondered what the U.S. Defense Department is saying tonight about the danger in Japan, and Martha Raddatz has that. We wanted to know, what is the worst case scenario in Japan? The reactor cores in several reactors get so hot, they fuse into a molten mass that bursts through the containment structures, spewing radioactivity into the water, air, and ground. Unlike Chernobyl, these Japanese reactors are surrounded by six-foot steel and concrete containment vessels. So even multiple reactor meltdowns would not likely be as bad as Chernobyl. But if there were meltdowns, how far could the radiation travel? If the wind is blowing out to the ocean, as it usually does, then most of the contamination goes out there. If it, the wind shifts south, well then, all the, some of the most heavily populated areas of Japan are at risk, including Tokyo itself. How about the U.S.? The fires could be so hot that it would send radioactive particles carrying it across the Pacific. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says even if that happened, there is a low likelihood that any harmful radiation would reach the U.S. or its territories. But uncertainty could continue for weeks in a scenario where there is no meltdown, but the reactors are not stabilized either. Martha Raddatz, ABC News, Washington. And as we know, the force of this storm, the force of this earthquake was so strong that it actually moved this island some eight feet closer to the United States. And today we got word it's been upgraded from an 8.9 earthquake to a 9. And our Clarissa Ward is up north where entire villages were obliterated. Clarissa. Diane, behind me is a high school which is now acting as a temporary shelter for some 400 people. And we passed dozens of shelters like this as we made our journey across some of the hardest hit areas. Pushing up north, the chaos and clamor of traffic-filled streets give way to ghost towns. So we're just now getting to some of the most devastated areas. And the first thing you notice is how eerily quiet it is here. This place literally feels deserted. And the devastation is just enormous. I mean, there are trees uprooted, houses crumpled, doorways blocked completely. And another thing we're really noticing now as we push further up into the north is the smell. More and more I can smell <coughs> decomposing bodies. Along this stretch of coast, there is almost no power and little food or water. What there is, is devastation. Memories of a home consigned to rubble. A pair of shoes, family photos, a child's drawing, a beautiful young girl. We talked to a neighbor and found out the devastating tragedy about the family next door. <laughs> My friends died, she tells me. So many people I know died. I ask her little girl if she's scared. She nods, still in shock. Tonight, residents have converged on a nearby shelter. This is their new reality. Volunteers have been providing some food for the people staying here. On average, they're getting about a ball of rice a day and some soup and a little bit of water. It's enough for now, but most people we spoke to inside say they just have no idea how long they will be here. Diane? The United States has 104 nuclear reactors in 31 states, raising the question based on Japan, what about those reactors and nuclear faults underneath? And David Wright decided to look more deeply into that. David? Good evening, Diane. We're at the San Onofre nuclear power plant midway between Los Angeles and San Diego, right on the coastline and smack in the middle of America's earthquake country. And what's going on in Japan raises very real concerns about the potential for such a disaster here. A deadly natural disaster that threatens to unleash an even deadlier man-made one. The operators of the San Onofre nuclear power plant insist they're prepared. Is this plant safe? Well, absolutely this plant is safe. We asked the White House to explain how U.S. nuclear safety standards compare to Japanese ones. U.S. power plants are designed to vary high standards for, for uh, earthquake 
uh, effect. Of the 100 plus nuclear power plants in the U.S., 11 are in areas prone to earthquakes. Early indications are the Daiichi reactor withstood the quake and the tsunami. But as we know, that one two punch cut off the power supply and then knocked out the backup generators, a scenario the industry calls a station blackout. There are many pathways to station blackout at atomic reactors here in the United States. Tsunamis could do it, earthquakes could do it. In Japan, the station blackout left battery power as the only way to cool the reactor long enough to shut it down. Industry officials say the batteries in Japan were designed to last 8 to 12 hours, apparently not long enough. In the U.S., some backup batteries last half that long. Some of the batteries in the U.S. are not as good as the Japanese. Here at San Onofre, they say they have learned a lot from past disasters. Now, of course, nuclear power plant operators have one more disaster to study, Diane. To give you a sense of the density of the population in Japan, it's as if you took half the population of the United States and moved everyone up into a state the size of Montana, which gives you a sense of how much need is concentrated in every acre. And this week's Christian Amanpour decided to look into how long. Diane, more than 90 countries are offering aid and assistance, but even four days into this disaster, the magnitude is so huge and the desperation overwhelming. I need food. I'm running out of food, says this businesswoman. But the good news is that some aid was prepositioned part of Japan's earthquake preparedness effort. We're trying to feed 2,000 people, maybe more. We'll continue as long as our rice lasts, says this aid worker. But the rice, like the rest of the supplies, is not nearly enough. So much more is needed, and the effort is Herculean. We saw that firsthand at the Red Cross Command Center here. What is your biggest challenge right now? The biggest challenge is for our relief operation at this moment is logistics. Much of northern Japan's infrastructure is in tatters, as we saw from the air. Its coastal roads, bridges and its rail system are all underwater, making it nearly impossible to reach by land. And so for now, the humanitarian intervention is dependent on military helicopters and any other aircraft to bring supplies in. But even so... Can you cope with caring for the whole coast? This is beyond our imagination. The Red Cross tells us that despite the logistical difficulties, the most urgent priority is getting food and water to any who may have survived. And after that, Diane, the grim task of collecting the bodies. There's a Japanese proverb that after a great storm, you can see more clearly where there is solid ground. As I traveled around this region, here's some of what I saw. Here in the landscape left behind by the storm without pity. Hello. The people here show what has always been at the heart of the Japanese culture. But you need the food. You need the food. <laughs> oh, we are fine. We have enough for us. So we want to share. In Japan, Shinto Buddhist and Confucian traditions promote considering community when you consider yourself. We saw this video on YouTube the moment after the earthquake interrupted a graduation ceremony. A brief moment of confusion and then everyone working together to clear the rubble. The prime minister used the phrase in announcing the blackouts he said would be required because of the shortage of electricity. This is the toughest and the most difficult crisis for Japan. But now we learn the government ordered blackouts don't have to happen because the people voluntarily stopped using non-essential power. This is a shelter. Some of these people here for days. And look. It's recycling, yeah. organized for recycling. Plastic, barnab combustible barnable, canes. The Japanese call it itai. It means to come together as one body. And something else astonishing after a disaster, not a single reported case of looting in a country of 128 million people. Instead, we saw astonishing patience and order, the long lines everywhere outside the grocery store for basics. You never believe this mother and so many others patiently hold their children for three hours while waiting to get food. <laughs> and before we leave, a new mother traveling the day the earthquake struck, giving birth amid the aftershocks, saying, I hope the baby is strong and brings new hope to Japan. 
And be sure to watch Nightline later on tonight. Co our co-anchor Bill Weir is here, right here in Japan as well. And we'll see you back here from Japan tomorrow night. Until then, we hope you have a good night at home in the United States.